speaker today. Thank you. Um, she joins us from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, and she's in her final year doing electrical engineering and computer science. And she's co advised by Mike Jordan and Jennifer Listgarden. Uh, she's fascinated by the statistical and inf inferential challenges that arise in using data to design novel proteins. Uh, before her time at Berkeley, she wrangled wild jellyfish at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, uh, tried to stabilize chaotic recurrent neural networks at Google Brain, and uh, also studied computer science at Stanford. So Clara, without further ado, take it away. Awesome. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, wait. Is that what I Do you guys see my screen? Good, okay, great. Okay, um, yeah, um, I'm Clara um, and thank you first to all the organizers for putting on this seminar series. Um, it's a really fun time to be doing machine learning for protein engineering. Um, and so this series has been like a lot of fun for, for me to listen to. And um, yeah, just thank you for all of your guys' work for that. Um, and before I get started, I want to say, please stop me and ask questions um, at any point in time, um, probably through the chat is easiest. Um, I'd really rather this be an engaging conversation where we learn from each other uh, than necessarily me getting through all the slides in full detail. Um, I want this talk to be super accessible to, to everyone. So um, let me know at any point if I say anything that's unclear, because I want to know what you guys are thinking about and have questions about. Okay. So um, today's talk was inspired by the following question. Um, when I train predictive models of fitness, um, and then I use that fitness model to design novel proteins, can I trust the model's predictions on the design proteins? And in particular, can I trust the model's predictions even though like the whole point of design is to move away from the training data, which is where the model's probably the most uncertain. Um, Right. Uh, so, yeah, so these are my fantastic uh, co-authors on this work, uh, Stephen Bates and Anastasios Angelopoulos, uh, and my co-advisors, Jen Lewis Garten and Michael Jordan, we're all at Berkeley, um, and actually very uh, conveniently timed. Um, the paper just came out a few moments ago on PNAS, so I didn't have time to update the slides, the citations in the slides, but the paper is actually finally out um, as of right now. All right. So um, this is uh, just a roadmap of what I'm going to be sharing today. Um, I'm first going to describe our problem setting of single shot design, and I'm going to, of course, focus on proteins, but the theory is general enough and would be applicable and relevant for designing other kinds of um, biological sequences as well. So I'll then describe a certain type of distribution shift that arises in single shot design, and this kind of distribution shift is actually what makes uncertainty quantifications so challenging in this setting. Um, so we call this kind of distribution shift feedback covariate shift, um, and it's this very important concept that we introduce and formalize in this work. I'm then going to walk through an introduction to conformal prediction. So conformal prediction is a super interesting area of research in its own right. Um, it's a method for getting frequentist um, valid and a frequentist notion so, uh, confidence intervals for prediction tasks. And then I'm going to describe how we generalize it to handle feedback covariate shift. And that generalization is what's going to allow us to do rigorous uncertainty quantification, not just for the design setting, but for other problem settings as well that can be described by feedback covariate shift. And I'll describe some of those um, as we go through this. Um, and then finally, I'm going to de demonstrate uh, briefly how our method works in experiments that simulate single shot design. And I think actually a really um, promising use case that I'll show is how we can use this method to do design algorithm selection. So just in the same way that in kind of standard machine learning, one might think about model selection, um, we can think in design about doing design algorithm selection, where we have to think about this trade-off between getting predictions that we like, but also staying in regions where we have low predictive uncertainty, and we can actually trust what the model's saying. So we can use our method to kind of visualize that trade-off, so we can actually select design algorithms that um, get to a sweet spot that we're okay with. <clears throat> Okay, so um, to start off, the problem setting in our work is single shot design. So notation wise, X is always going to refer to a protein sequence, and um, Y is always going to refer to the fitness of interest. 
So, uh, and this is always going to be a function of X. So this could be fluorescence. Um, it could be catalytic activity of an enzyme, um, like in Jonathan's talk two weeks ago, uh, or any other real value property um, that's a function of the sequence X. So when we have this ground truth fitness function that we're interested in kind of designing proteins that um, uh, have very high fitness on. So um, we get a single batch of assay labeled data points. This is X, I, Y, I. And the goal of the problem is um, without needing any additional batches of data, we want to design protein sequences that have high fitness. So how do we do this? Um, one common approach people have been doing is to train some regression model on the labeled data. This could be a neural network, um, linear regression, whatever. Um, people will then use um, a design algorithm that tries to find inputs X that this model believes to have high fitness. So that algorithm could be a genetic algorithm. It could be a gradient-based procedure. Um, it could be some procedure that trains a conditional generative model, um, whatever your preference is. So in recent years, this approach of like deploying a design algorithm on top of the predictions of a trained model has uh, been growing in popularity. Um, we People have used it to design small molecules, uh, incompressible materials, and of course, fluorescent proteins and enzymes. Uh, photoreceptors and binding proteins. And of course, we know that there's countless other potential applications of this kind of paradigm. <clears throat> um, but of course, it kind of brings up a lot of interesting unsolved problems. And in particular, uh, the regression model, which is um, this orange curve here, uh, is not the same thing as the ground truth, which is the black curve. And it generally deviates from the black curve. It deviates from the ground truth the further we move from the training data. However, the whole point of design in some sense is to move away from the training data to find something better than what we've seen before. Um, so that kind of puts us in a conundrum where we have to move away from the training data, but if we do that, how can we trust the regression model's predictions on the design proteins? So if I design a protein and the model says it's really good, how do I know it's actually really good instead of just the model being super, super wrong? So our work, um, enables rigorous uncertainty quantification for this single shot design uh, setting for any design algorithm using any trained predictive model. So um, not just specific model classes like Gaussian process regression, but any model that you might care to be using. And with our method, we, we can kind of know uh, when the design algorithm is moving into regions with too much predictive uncertainty. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the first step in in um, in doing this and in, in doing this uncertainty quantification is we're going to characterize a special type of distribution shift that happens in design, uh, which is called feedback covariate shift. So we're going to kind of look at what that is now. So feedback covariate shift, which is this notion that we introduce, um, is a distribution shift where the training and the design data are statistically dependent because the training data um, are, are used to choose the distribution of design inputs. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so breaking down this uh, just a bit more, we're gonna start with some training data, which is generated from some input distribution, uh, which is denoted here in this kind of like periwinkle, I guess, distribution PX. Um, and there's a conditional distribution of Y given X, which is this kind of gray curve here. And the training data is given by these uh, blue points. So the key phenomenon in feedback covariate shift is that this training data right here that we sampled is going to induce some distribution of design inputs. And that relationship is going to make the training and design data statistically dependent. Um, so specifically, we're going to take this training data and fit some regression model to it. So again, this could be whatever you want, neural network, Gaussian process regression, gradient boosted trees. Um, we're then gonna deploy some design algorithm using that model. Again, that algorithm could be genetic algorithm, gradient based thing, a generative modeling thing. Um, and that whole procedure of deploying the design algorithm on top of the regression model is going to create some new distribution of sequences. And that new distribution of sequences we'll call uh, P tilde X. Um, which is what our designed uh, sequences will be sampled from. 
And so those design data are in these green dots here. Okay, so the key point here is like, because of this whole pipeline involving the regression model and the design algorithm, the design data and the training data are actually statistically dependent. And that um, dependence is what distinguishes feedback covariate shift from other kinds of distribution shifts that have been studied in the literature so far. And that dependence is also what makes uncertainty quantification in this setting really hard um, because like the dependence is via this regression model and this design algorithm, both of which are very complicated and hard to actually analyze. Okay, so that's feedback covariate shift. Um, I'll note that feedback covariate shift is actually pretty common in real world applications of machine learning, not just in design. So whenever we use a, a regression model to make decisions about what input data to see next, you're gonna have a situation that's like feedback covariate shift. So this includes like Bayesian optimization, active learning, experimental design. Um, feedback covariate shift is one lens with which to see the distribution shift that's induced when you do those kinds of things. Um, so all that is to say is that because our work generalizes conformal prediction to feedback covariate shift, it actually applies in theory to, to those different kinds of problem settings as well. Okay, so I'll stop here first for, for questions. Um, so in the chat, uh, the question is, does single shot here in design equal, uh, equal to offline and optimization? Um, I, I think so if we're using the terms in the same way. So in, I think like offline RL, it's we're probably using those terms in the same way where you just have like your fixed data from a certain policy, you don't get to see any more data and you just have to do the best that you can with that one um, single batch of data. So yeah I, 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 yeah, I think it's pretty similar to what you'd have in offline RL. Okay. Okay, so any questions about feedback covariate shift as a kind of description of what happens in design? Okay, so um, now I'm gonna uh, do a quick introduction to conformal prediction and then describe how we modify that to accommodate feedback covariate shift. Um, and this part will be the main technical part of the talk because I think it's insightful to, to walk through the actual mechanism of conformal prediction. <clears throat> so what is conformal prediction? Um, I'm first going to lay out the problem setting for conformal prediction um, in the kind of standard IID setting um, and make sure that we kind of are all on the same page with how that works and then uh, briefly overview how we adjusted things to accommodate a feedback covariate shift. Okay, so the setting for conformal prediction is that we have n training points, x1, y1 through xn, yn, and one test point, which I'm always gonna note, to note as xn plus one, yn plus one. So throughout this talk, uh, whenever you see n plus one, that's always gonna refer to like the, the test point, just for notational convenience. Okay, so of course we don't know why n plus one at test time, and the whole goal will be um, given x n plus one, we want to construct a confidence set that contains y n plus one with high probability. And the key assumption and the only assumption that we need to make conformal prediction work is that um, the training and test points are exchangeable. So exchangeable just means that the joint probability of these n plus one points does not change itself if I shuffle their order. So the joint probability is like invariant to the permutation. So the most common example you can think of for exchangeable uh, data is just IID. Um, but exchangeability you should keep in the back of your head is actually really much more general than IID. Um, so for example, if I have two um, zero mean Gaussians that are correlated, they're not IID because they're correlated but they are exchangeable because if I switch the order of the two, it's still the same like bivariate Gaussian. Okay, so exchangeability is like the one key thing we need here. Um, so given this training data, I'd like to train a regression model mu to predict y from x. And the goal will be, again, given test input x n plus one, I want to construct a confidence set called C alpha that gives coverage. And coverage just means um, that the true label falls into that confidence set with probability at least one minus alpha for any user specified miscoverage level alpha. Okay, that's the goal of conformal prediction. So 
Conformal prediction can do this without any assumptions on the model, any assumptions on the um, ground truth distribution of y given x. Um, it's also a finite sample statement, which means there's no asymptotics. I don't need n to go to infinity. Uh, I get this coverage statement for any number n. And again, all that we need for conformal prediction to work is that the data are exchangeable, which is really crazy. Um, that's that's the only thing that we need, and it's it's a very interesting and um, very cool insight. Okay, so this might sound like magic, like how can we get all of these things without any assumptions in the model or the ground truth? That sounds pretty crazy. Um, so there's two things to keep in mind that maybe can convince you that this is not crazy. Um, the first thing to note is that you can always get coverage trivially by just returning the entire um, real line. So like if, if C alpha X N plus one was just the real line, of course, you'd always get coverage. The real label would always fall into that set. Um, so in practice, conformal prediction might give you sets that um, achieve coverage, but they might be large and they might be too large to be informative. So in practice, you should always be like uh, assessing whether or not like, yeah, you might be getting coverage, but maybe it's like at a cost where it's like not as not useful enough of a confidence set because it's too large. <clears throat> okay, secondly, notice that coverage is a, what's called a marginal probability statement. So this probability here is over all the randomness in both the training and the test data. So coverage is a statement about what happens on average when I draw n training points in one test point. It doesn't guarantee anything about the confidence set constructed for any one particular test point. So there might be certain types of inputs where the set doesn't cover. There might be certain other types of inputs where the set always covers. And this kind of marginal um, coverage statement doesn't um, kind of prevent that kind of that kind of thing from happening. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> This is kind of like this This one slide here is kind of the um, high level summary of conformal prediction that you kind of uh, take away from this. Um, I will finally note that conformal prediction is not one algorithm. So that term doesn't refer to one algorithm. It's actually a general approach that's been instantiated as uh, many different algorithms, um, that, but they all revolve around this key assumption of exchangeability and they all use it in the same way. So to give us some intuition about how that exchangeability allows us to do this, I'm gonna walk through um, one of the simplest algorithms called split conformal prediction. Um, and after we look at split conformal, I'm gonna move on to full conformal prediction, which is the algorithm that we worked on generalizing and extending. Um, I'll quickly look at the question in the chat. Um, is there any way to characterize the error modes you were referring to? If there are shared properties among the test points that won't be covered? Yeah, so there's like a whole like art, um, I guess, of uh, evaluating the applicability of conformal prediction to any particular uh, problem setting. Um, my co-authors, uh, Stephen Bates and Anastasios, actually have a really great um, gentle introduction to the conformal prediction that outlines a lot of these things you can do. Um, yeah, but there's like standard easy checks you can do is to be like, if there's certain groups um, in your data, in your chat, in your data that you think are particularly might be sensitive to miscoverage or overcoverage, you can check coverage uh, specifically conditional on those groups and try to assess how much of this coverage is like super imbalanced between different types of groups. Um, but that's like a, a very active area of research too of trying to make sure we get what's called conditional coverage. Sure, okay. Um, so, right, okay. So I'm gonna walk through split conformal prediction. That's gonna um, really expose the insight of exchangeability and show how this all works. Um, yeah, so let's look at that. Okay, so split conformal prediction says, you're gonna take all your labeled data your, your like assay labeled protein data, you're gonna randomly split it into training data and calibration data. Um, now you take the training data and you fit your model to that training data only. So you don't get to fit the model to all of the data, you have to hold some out for calibration purposes. Then what you do um, is at test time, um, you ignore your training data because you've already used it. You just set it aside, you never look at it again. So at test time, you have um, 
calibration data, which will be these first n data points. And then you're going to have a, a single test data point, x n plus 1, y n plus 1. So um, if we, uh, so of course, we don't know why n plus 1 at test time. But um, just as a thought experiment to understand how this method works, um, just imagine that we have this y n plus 1. Um, now imagine that we compute the residual of all of these points um, with respect to mu, which was trained on the training data. And uh, the residual or notation, I'm going to call it uh, S, uh, SI is going to refer to the residual of the i theta point with respect to the prediction under the model mu. Um, and I'm going to call this the score instead of the residual because um, you can actually use much more flexible things uh, other than just the residual. I'm going to be using the residual as like my representative example throughout this talk because it's like the easiest to understand and very intuitive. Um, but basically, I'm going to compute this score for each of these n plus one data points. Um, and the key insight to note here is that if the calibration and test data are exchangeable, then these scores are also exchangeable. Um, if I shuffle the order of the data, the, the joint and, and then the corresponding scores, um, their joint distribution is not going to change. <clears throat> okay, so now I have exchangeable scores. What does that mean? Well, since S, the scores S1 through Sn plus 1 are exchangeable, that just means, uh, that tells us that the rank of the test score Sn plus 1, it's uniformly distributed at, on 1 through n plus 1. So this is the key fact about exchangeable data or exchangeable random variables that makes conformal prediction work. It's the fact that if a bunch of scores are exchangeable, then the rank of any one score is uniformly distributed on the numbers one, two, all the way through n plus one. Okay, so now we know that the, the rank of this test score is uniformly distributed on these numbers. We can just use a uh, fact about uniform distributions to say that that means the rank of Sn plus one is no greater than one minus alpha times N plus one, uh, at least one minus alpha with at least one minus alpha probability. Okay, so why is that? If you, if you take any distribution and you take the one minus alpha quantile, then the random variable is going to lie underneath that quantile with probability one minus alpha. Like that's just the definition of um, a quantile. So applying that here, the one minus alpha quantile of the uniform distribution over these integers, one through n plus one, that is exactly um, one minus alpha times n plus one. So that tells us that the rank of this test score, um, we basically know an upper bound on it with high probability. Okay. So from that um, fact, um, I can just rewrite that. That's the same thing as saying that the test score is less than the one minus alpha n plus one um, order statistic or the one minus alpha n plus one uh, smallest score with probability at least one minus alpha. So now if I just expand out what this test score really is, that means that the residual is less than this, uh, this score with probability at least one minus alpha. Okay, and now that I have this bottom statement here, I'm pretty much done. I can use that to make confidence intervals. So at test time, I just output the prediction um, plus and plus and minus um, that particular quantile of the scores that I had. And um, that's all that split conformal is. It just says um, you compute um, you compute a whole bunch of residuals. You take the one minus alpha quantile of them. And then you just add that to your prediction at test time. And um, because these scores are exchangeable, um, you'll get the guarantee that the true label is going to fall into that confidence set with probability at least one minus alpha. OK, so uh, I'll stop there. Are there any questions about how split conformal works? Okay. Um, 
I will move on then. Um, again, let me know if at any point there's anything uh, I should clarify um, with notation or any of the concepts that I'm, I'm using. <clears throat> okay, so we in and protein engineering may not want to use uh, split conformal because we're only allowed to fit our model to the training data. We have to split up our labeled data, our precious assay labeled protein sequences into some that we're gonna use for training and then some that we're gonna use for calibration, which means we don't get to use all of it for training the model, which is not like, we, we would really like to be able to use all the data, especially if these data were very expensive to acquire. Um, so <clears throat> that's the biggest reason why one wouldn't want to be using split conformal. Um, so really what you would wanna do is to fit the model, which you, what you'd like to be able to do is fit the model mu to all of your labeled data and then hope that a procedure like this still works. Uh, unfortunately, if you fit the model to all the labeled data, this procedure will not work. And the reason is because that you're gonna end up violating exchangeable scores. If you fit the model to all of your labeled data and then compute the residuals on that same training data, um, the residual on the test data is not gonna be exchangeable with the residuals on the training data. And this kind of fits with our intuition that um, if you like train your model on some data and then look at its performance on that same data that you trained on, you're double dipping. So you, you don't really get a, like a, a, an unbiased notion of the actual error characteristics of your model. So that means that if we want to be using all of our labeled data for training the model, we can't use this, we have to do something else. So that's what um, conformal prediction or full conformal prediction, which is the algorithm that we built off of um, does. So full conformal prediction is going to try to allow you to um, train your model on all your labeled data, but still somehow get exchangeable scores so that you can still work through um, this procedure here. Okay, so the intuition behind, behind full conformal prediction is that we're gonna include all real values y such that the score of the candidate test point x n plus one y is sufficiently similar to the scores of the training data. And when I say sufficiently similar, I, I mean in the sense that we just figured it out here where the rank of that test score is not too big. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna walk through how this works for full conformal prediction. So um, given a candidate value, a candidate label Y, how do I decide whether or not to include it into the confidence set? Um, I'm going to lay out all my training data. So that's the first, these end data points here. Then I'm gonna, I'm gonna have my uh, candidate test point here, X n plus one comma little Y. I'm then gonna construct scores for these n plus one data points in a very particular way. So for the first data point, I'm gonna look at all the rest of the n training points, uh, which is training points two through n, as well as this candidate test point. I'll train a regression model on that, which I call uh, mu minus one y. Um, and then I'm going to score the first training data point with its residual under that model. Okay, so for the second, data point, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna take the remaining n points, which is this first training data point and the training data points is three through n and then this candidate test point. Train a different regression model on that, mu minus two y, and then score that point with the residual under that model. I'm gonna do the same thing for all the rest of the training data points. And for the candidate test point, do the same thing. I'm gonna take the remaining n points, which are just the n original training points, train a regression model called mu one through n, um, and then score it with the, um, with the residual. Okay, so for cleaner notation, I'm just gonna call all those things S sub I Y um, to denote them as being the score. And now that we have all their scores, um, I'm gonna take the score of the candidate test point, S N plus one Y, and I'm gonna compare it to the rest of the scores to decide whether or not to include Y in the confidence set. So if I like order all the scores, like sort them in order, I'm just going to check if the test score of the candidate and test points score is less than or equal to the one minus alpha n plus one um, <clears throat> order statistic of the scores. So it's the same kind of check that we did uh, in the split conformal setting. So if it is less than this, then I'm just going to include the candidate label y in C alpha confidence set. <clears throat> 
So that's um, that's our confidence set. It's just going to be defined as all real values such that the score of that candidate test point is less than or equal to the one minus alpha quantile of all those scores. Okay, so now in practice, of course, you can't check through every value on the real line. So in practice, you're uh, going to take a finite grid of candidate values, iterate through that finite grid of candidate values, and do this procedure, and that works pretty well in practice. Okay, so um, that's how full conformal works. And um, really, the key insight, again, is that like the way that we scored the points had to be modified so that we retained exchangeability, even though we are training on all of the labeled data and also kind of checking our error on it. <clears throat> okay, so again, if the data are exchangeable, this confidence set that we just walked through achieves coverage. Um, and that's like the, the main statement about uh, full conformal prediction here. Um, Yes, yeah, so the proof of this is like basically the exact same as we saw for the split conformal setting. It's just that as long as you have um, exchangeable scores, which we managed to get, um, then you can just take the one minus alpha quantile and you know that the test score is going to lie under that with a certain probability. And that's really the entire insight. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and um, ask if there are any questions about split conformal, full conformal how we get the exchange ability or uh, anything else. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna skip through this because we already saw it. Um, okay, so... Um, So uh, we've seen here like that this confidence set that we defined up here is um, going to give us coverage in the exchangeable setting. Um, <clears throat> oh, there's a question. I'm going to answer this quickly. Um, does this approach require assumptions about how well PY of X, PY given X is sampled by the finite training data X? In an example where X is bimodal, but all the X, Y pairs come from one mode of the data, are we still guaranteed good CIs? Yeah, this, this is a, a great question. So um, conformal prediction is always going to give you confidence intervals that have coverage. <clears throat> um, it's always, um, yeah, yeah. it's always going to give you a confidence set that has coverage, uh, but those sets might be like literally like way too big to be useful. Like they might even be negative infinity to infinity or something like that. Um, and so that's like the failure mode in some sense of conformal prediction. And that's one reason why coverage is not always the thing that you um, want to look at at the cost of just not looking at anything else. Um, so if you don't have a lot of training data, you're going to see those effects more frequently, especially if the data is like weird and imbalanced and bimodal that way. Um, yeah, so the key question is, uh, another question is how to reconcile exchangeability and feedback um, covariate shift. Yeah, so that's exactly um, what our work kind of uh, focused on doing. So I'm gonna walk through that right now. Um, so um, to kind of um, kind of prepare our thinking for how we accommodate feedback covariate shift, um, I'm just gonna rewrite this confidence setup here that we've been looking at in a slightly different way, which is that uh, which is to say that like I wrote this as the one minus alpha n plus one order statistic, but it's the same thing. It's like the exact same thing. I can just rewrite it as the quantile, the one minus alpha quantile of this distribution, this discrete distribution where I just have um, a mass at each of the n plus one um, scores. Um, and if I rewrite it this way, this will kind of allow us to um, introduce some generalizations here. Okay. So remember that our intuition for exchangeable data for full conformal prediction is that we're gonna include all real values y such that the score of the candidate test point looks sufficiently similar to the scores of the training data. And by sufficiently similar, we specifically mean uh, no greater than the one minus alpha quantile of these scores. Now notice here in this kind of um, quantile expression that these scores are weighted equally, which kind of makes sense because like the data are exchangeable, so it feels right to 
to weight them all equally when you're comparing this test point. Um, however, it turns out that if we weight data points differently, we can actually construct weights carefully um, so that uh, this set achieves coverage not just for exchangeable data, but for data under feedback covariate shift. Okay, so for feedback covariate shift, our intuition is going to be very similar just with those weights. So we're going to include all real values y um, such that the score of the test point is sufficiently similar to the other scores, uh, except each score is now weighted. Um, and this weight, again, is going to carefully take into account the fact that um, the training and design data come from different distributions, but also that those data are statistically dependent through a uh, feedback covariate shift. So in particular, this weight, W sub I, Y, it's going to look like this. It's proportional to a likelihood ratio, where in the bottom, we have the likelihood under the training input, uh, the training input distribution. And in the numerator, we have the input distribution um, we have like the sequence, the design sequence distribution that we would get uh, if we had a regression model trained on this data set here. So Z minus I with a candidate test point. And um, that notation just refers to this same like leave one out data set that we used to, um, that we used to train the models to get the scores. So this just refers to if I take all the training data, add my candidate test point, but exclude the I. Um, point. So this distribution in the denominator is basically the distribution of design sequences I would get if I deployed my design algorithm on a regression model trained on this data set. So that's like a very complicated way of saying that this weight here, basically um, this weight on the ith training score reflects how likely the ith training sequence would be designed if all the other data were used for the training data. Um, yeah, so this is a very kind of involved uh, computation. Um, again, the high level point is just that these weights take into account the fact that the data are statistically dependent and are from different distributions in this weird way through feedback covariate shift. Um, okay. So um, our main result, again, is that this, uh, this confidence set used with these weights um, gives you coverage for data under feedback covariate shift. So that means you can use any design algorithm you want with any regression model you want to design novel proteins. And with probability at least one minus alpha, um, the true label of the design protein is gonna fall into this C alpha set. All right, so um, that's the procedure that we came up with. Um, it should be clear that it's quite computationally involved. Um, it involves kind of doing the like training multiple models on these leave one out data sets to both get the scores and to construct these weights. Um, and in the paper, we show how there's actually a few very important special cases, um, specifically with linear regression and Gaussian process regression for any kernel, where you can compute this set actually much, much, much more efficiently in a way that actually makes it practical. Um, but if you're uh, if you use like a deep neural network or something like that, it may or may not be feasible to like actually um, explicitly compute this set and something like split conformal prediction might make more sense. So um, yeah, it's very instructive to kind of contrast this with split conformal prediction. Um, it kind of exposes this uh, dichotomy or this uh, spectrum of conformal prediction algorithms where on one end uh, there's split conformal, which is computationally super lightweight, like you just compute n plus one residuals, take a quantile, you're done. But the trade-off is like you have to hold out a bunch of data from training and you can't train on all your data. So it's very data inefficient. On the other end of the spectrum, there's full conformal prediction, which we've just walked through, which is the most data efficient you can get. You can use all of your data for kind of simultaneous training and uh, calibration. But the trade-off, of course, is that it's much more computationally intensive. So depending on your assay, the throughput of the assay, the quality of the assay, um, and your problem setting, one of one or the other, other, other of these might be um, more appropriate for you. All right, um, I'll stop here for any questions on this. <laughs>
is a is a middle ground possible? Yeah. So um, there are other variants of uh, conformal called like cross conformal is like the main one I can think of where the setup is a little bit like um, K fold cross validation where you you know you split things up into K folds and you can have some intermediary um, uh, to kind of navigate in between these two. Um, yes, yeah, so sp for split conformal, if you leave out data, there's also a way of reweighting to account for the distribution shift you get for design. Um, uh, it actually, when you leave out data in split conformal, you actually simplify your setting because you cut off the statistical dependence between the calibration and test data. So when you, in the split conformal setting, like there's now statistical dependence between the training and test, but because you left out the calibration, there's no dependence between the calibration and test. And so that actually returns you to the setting of just normal covariate shift. Um, and so you can compute weights uh, that would be appropriate for normal covariate shift. And that was work that was worked out by um, Ryan Tibshirani, Emmanuel Kendis, um, Rina Barbara, and Aditya Ramdas. Um, yeah, so there's a way of doing that as well. Okay, so now that we've seen how to construct uh, these confidence sets, um, I'm gonna quickly demonstrate how this works in a simulated protein design experiment. Um, and in particular, I'm gonna try to show how we can use this method to visualize the trade-off between um, like predictive uncertainty and getting high predictions, which are predictions that we want. So um, in this experiment, the goal was to design brighter fluorescent proteins for both blue and red fluorescence. We used data from a 2019 paper that assayed blue and red brightness of a complete landscape of protein variants. So specifically, they took two wild-type fluorescent parents, which differed at just 13 sequences, and then assayed the brightness of every possible variant that had one, um, either one of the parents amino acids at each of those 13 sites. So that's a data set of two to the 13 or uh, more than 8,000 assayed proteins in this complete landscape. And this was a uh, very convenient for a simulated design because a big problem with evaluating in silico design algorithms is that unlike in standard machine learning prediction tasks, you don't typically know the label of a design protein. Um, but with a data set like this, what we can do is um, randomly sample endpoints as training data, train a model, and then design a protein in that same space. Uh, and then conveniently, we already have the ground truth label of that design protein. So we can simulate using training data to design proteins, use our method to construct confidence sets, and then just check if the real label actually fell into that confidence set. Okay, so for a bit more detail, uh, the fitness, fitness model we used here was just a ridge regression model with all um, singleton and pairwise interactions between the 13 sites. Um, uh, and the design algorithm, um, we use a pretty simple design algorithm that's been um, used in practice, which is to uh, sample sequences, um, the design sequence xn plus one is going to be sampled from this distribution, p tilde x, uh, which is an energy-based model. It's called an energy-based model um, where the energy function or the log likelihood of the distribution is just this constant lambda times the prediction of the regression model mu. Um, so in other words, for any protein sequence, the higher the regression model's prediction, the higher the likelihood that that sequence is selected as the design sequence. So sampling from this distribution should give you sequences with very high predictions. Okay, so let's think a little bit more about this design algorithm. Uh, importantly, there's this hyperparameter lambda. Um, greater values of lambda will mean that we tend to design sequences with higher predicted fluorescence because um, this likelihood depends on the prediction more. Um, however, as lambda grows too large, it probably also means that we're accessing the model in areas of higher predictive uncertainty since we're kind of going farther and farther from the training data. So a question we can ask ourselves as protein engineers in this setting is how should I set lambda? Um, I don't know where to set it so that I get kind of a nice trade-off between these things. So um, I'm first going to orient us to the effects of different uh, values of lambda. So what we did in these experiments is we sampled 96, 192, or 384 training points uniformly at random from the complete data set. We'll train our regression model and then design a protein by sampling from that distribution. 
for different values of lambda. Um, we then, we performed like several thousand trials of that protocol and that, um, that set of trials resulted in these distributions of design proteins. So again, just to orient ourselves, a lambda equals zero is equivalent to a uniform distribution. Um, so this, these distributions here are the distributions you would get if you just picked sequences uniformly at random. So most of those sequences have a pretty low um, brightness score. Uh, and as we bring lambda up, um, at lambda equals four or greater, you can see that most design sequences will be in this kind of upper mode of brightness, uh, which is what we want. And that trend, that trend is um, pretty much true for all the different numbers of training data. Okay, so now in this plot for each of those trials, we used our method to construct a confidence set for the design protein. And what's plotted here is empirical coverage, which is the fraction of those trials where a confidence set actually contained the true label. Um, and here alpha equals 0.1, so one minus alpha is 0.9. And you can see as like, just as we showed in theory, the coverage is above uh, one minus alpha. Um, and actually the good thing is that it's actually not too much larger than 0.9 either. It's kind of tracking 0.9 closely, which means that it's uh, achieving coverage without going into that failure mode I mentioned of just making the, the confidence that's like super large to be able to cover everything. So that's good. Um, and finally here, uh, these are the distributions of the widths of those confidence intervals. Um, so, you can kind of see some patterns here that will agree with intuition. So you can see that as we increase the number of training points, um, so um, as we increase the number of training points going from 96 in the blue to uh, 384 in the green, the confidence sense tends to, tend to get smaller and smaller. So um, that's actually pretty consistent with our intuition. Like we all have this intuition that the less training data we have, kind of the more uncertain the model should be. Uh, and that's the same uh, kind of phenomenon that we're seeing here. We also see this phenomenon that um, as we increase that lambda, the inverse temperature, the confidence sets tend to get wider and wider. And again, that also agrees with intuition where as we're probing the regression model in like more and more extreme values of prediction, that's probably in, um, at some point, it's going to be in regions that are farther and farther from the training data. So it'll be particularly uncertain about those, those regions. And that's also what we see here. Okay, so takeaway from this is that all in all, a greater lambda means both higher predictions, but it also means higher uncertainty. Um, and I know this is specific to this particular design algorithm, but for most design algorithms, there's some kind of hyperparameter that kind of allows you to um, adjust how aggressively you're going to like climb the regression model. And this kind of trade-off is always going to be apparent when we have a um, design algorithms with those kind of hyperparameters. Okay, so again, how should we be choosing lambda? We can use these confidence intervals that we just computed to visualize that trade-off. So we can make a plot like this, where the x-axis is the predicted fitness and the y-axis is the mean confidence interval width. And there's two curves here, one for like the blue uh, fluorescence um, data set, one for um, red fluorescence. And different points on this curve correspond to different settings of lambda. So um, yeah, so the first thing to note, of course, is like there's this trade-off as I increase in uh, higher and higher predictive fitness, which is what I want. I also get higher, like larger and larger intervals, which is what I don't want. Um, the other thing to note here is actually this qual this trade-off is qualitatively different for these two different data sets, which exposes how this kind of method can allow you to visualize that trade-off, which may um, may uh, may look good or bad depending on your problem setting and allow you to um, see what's happening. So in particular for this blue fluorescence data set, the trade-off's not super bad in the sense that like as we keep increasing in mean predictive fitness, yes, our confidence intervals, um, do increase, but by far not to the extent to that the red fluorescence um, <clears throat> situation does. So for red fluorescence, for any like unit increase in mean predictive fitness, we have to pay a lot in like larger and larger confidence intervals. 
Um, so this kind of a plot can enable us to choose a, a setting of a design algorithm in a way that takes into account predictive uncertainty instead of just solely relying on the predictions of, of the model. Um, right, so there's a question in the chat, uh, was the red fluorescence data set more multimodal? That's a really good question. Um, there, there were clearly, it, it definitely seemed like, so the regression model definitely had a harder time like fitting well to the red fluorescence data set. I'm not entirely sure why that's the case. It might have something to do with like the, I don't know, the fluorescence channel that was used in the assay. I don't think in particular that it was more multimodal, um, but there was definitely something like systematically different about it that made the regression model, um, gave the regression model a harder time fitting to that data. And that's exactly why you see this more steep trade-off uh, with the predictive uncertainty. Cool. Um, yeah, so um, if you're interested in additional details, feel free to uh, check out the paper, which again, just came out, I think a few hours ago, uh, which is very convenient. Um, we also have another example on um, AAV library design that's in that paper. Um, and yeah, we're currently working on extensions to other kinds of design settings. And I'm also like always super excited to talk to um, potential collaborators. Um, if you have any ideas about how to make this more applicable to protein engineering, um, yeah, ways to tailor it to particular problems, uh, please reach out. I'd love to talk. I think there's a lot of exciting open problems here. Um, and I think a meta point of this work is that uh, there's actually many, many different ways of assessing the validity of an uncertainty quantification method. Right, like Bayesians have one notion, like they always use predictive, uh, posterior predictive uncertainty. Coverage is another notion of validity, which conformal prediction enables us to achieve. Um, but there's also other notions of validity that people, like we may not have really fully thought about yet. Um, and I think it's going to become really important and a lot of fun, actually, to think about what notions of uncertainty, quantification, validity are most appropriate for the protein engineering setting. Um, and with that, um, thank you guys all for uh, giving your time and listening. Um, thanks to a lot of people in the Liskarten Lab and, and Jordan Labs for giving me helpful discussions with this. Uh, and also for the AAV data, I want to give a quick shout out to David Schaefer, Akaswa, uh, Dan Ching Zhu, and, and David Brooks for uh, helping us with that data. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Claire, for that wonderful presentation. Um, at this point, we can just open it up to the audience for any questions that might not have been covered um, sort of intermediately in the talk. Um, so feel free to post your questions in the chat um, and we'll just take them one by one. Yeah, um, thanks, Hunter. Uh, have you tried restricting the training data to exclude the brightest, most fit examples, but still allowing those fittest examples to be designed? How do the CIs and coverage change? Yeah, so if you do, um, this data is quite bimodal as as um, you like very cleverly anticipated. Um, so if you do the scheme that you're suggesting, if you like keep the bottom-ish quantile chunk of data, do kind of naive, um, naive conformal with that, you're definitely not going to be getting coverage. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, Let's see, what else could you do? You could keep the bottom, the bottom mode of data. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I think what you might be getting, at, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you set this up so that the, in the training distribution was restricted to the bottom portion of data, but you still ran everything uh, accounting for feedback covariateship. Yeah, so if you do that, um, yeah, so you get much like much larger confidence in roles for sure. Uh, just accounting. So so what happens is that like uh, because like the weights the the like so I described them in the feedback variation shift setting. You have to compute these weights for the training scores. Those weights get hugely inflated because you're moving into regions where the training distribution likelihood is very very low. So that that likelihood ratio in the weight ends up exploding. Uh, and that ends up um, putting a lot of mass on like really, really large residuals and even infinity sometimes. So definitely the the more different from the 
the more different your training and test distributions are, the larger your confidence intervals are going to be in general. Um, okay. Uh, so thanks for that question. Um, so how does this technique work or generalize um, for multi-output, multi-class models, for example, binding affinity and specificity? Yeah, this is a great question um, and something I would um, have had a lot of false starts in trying to trying to work on is like, how do we do uncertainty quantification from basically multi-objective kind of design um, algorithms? Um, so naively, you could do the exact same thing if you had two separate models, or let's see. Actually, you don't even need two separate models. If you have a model that has two different outputs, as long as you can um, like score individually with respect to, to those two different outputs, you can do the exact same thing. Uh, I guess the question is like whether there's something smarter than that that one could do in the multi-objective setting, especially when you have many objectives. And that's something I'd like be very, interested to work on on more as well. Um, okay, so how do the interval variables intervals vary as you change alpha? Are there big changes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so alpha is generally kind of probably according to your intuition, like as you, as your missed coverage gets more and more, the confidence intervals will get smaller and smaller. So if you say, I only want a confidence interval of like 0.5 versus 0.9 coverage, um, that's gonna allow the method to report to use smaller intervals, which in some sense is more useful because they're smaller, but they're also gonna have smaller coverage. Yeah, so how would you pick alpha? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, I guess, depending on your internal <laughs> risk tolerance, <laughs> um, I guess like if you look at the budget you have for assaying a design sequence and you think, oh, okay, I could assay with my current grant money, 20 sequences at high fidelity and not be super mad that like one of them, um, one of them is totally off, then you would pick, I guess, 95% coverage, one over 20. If you had the if you had the budget to be like, I'm totally fine if like half of them fail, uh, you could pick alpha equals 0.5. All right, any last questions before we sign off for today? All right, well, let's thank our speaker, Clara, one more time. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, Claire, if you want, you can like, if, if you want to answer more questions, you can like put your email in, in the chat and that way people have access oh, to you, but no, sure, no pressure yeah. to do that. Um, I will, I'll do that now. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you guys so much for organizing this and having me uh, speak and thank you all for, for listening. It was really fun. Uh, I'll just, yeah, I'll leave my email in the chat. All right. Well, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us again. Bye.